Hi. Welcome to CA Panel Room 2. We've got another exciting discussion right now from Dr. Haverlick uh, here in the front row. Uh, he'll be speaking to rejecting conventional wisdom for a competitive advantage. Don't swim like Phelps. Welcome, Dr. Haverlick. Thank you. <clears throat> Appreciate it. And, and good afternoon. So how many of you are swimmers? Really? Wow. I'm impressed. Okay. Because I wanted to start out with an activity to get everybody on track and, and, and have a better feeling for exactly what I'm going to talk about. But it wouldn't hurt to go through this anyway. Uh, here we have Michael Phelps swimming butterfly. He has just completed his arm entry. And I want you to look at the angle at his shoulders. Now, where you're sitting, if you would just raise your arms overhead and replicate that angle. Yeah, if you think you're replicating that angle, I suggest you do it in front of a mirror. <clears throat> but if, if you can imagine how much stress is on his shoulders, and then think about repeating that one or maybe two million times. And think about what your shoulders would feel like after doing that. Well, we're going to come back to Phelps. Let's look where swimming has, has, how swimming has progressed over the past 100 years. Here's the world record for the 100 meter freestyle. And the current world record is about 47 seconds. Here's a regression line through these data points that predicts that in the year 2060, we could have someone break a 40 second 100 meter freestyle. Now that's assuming that we stick with the conventional wisdom. Well, we have science data that shows that we can get there a lot quicker. We're going to come back to those data points. Let me show you what I do. I put sensors on swimmers' hands. The sensors measure the pressure on the palm of the hand and the back of the hand. With that pressure data, we can calculate hand force. Once a swimmer's outfitted with the sensors, we have a camera underwater at the end of the pool, and then the swimmer swims towards the camera. This way we can simultaneously capture hand force data and underwater video. When the trial's complete, we've got the video image in the middle. We have the hand force data for the left hand across the top, for the right hand across the bottom. And the vertical gray lines are synchronized with the video image. And this gives us a tremendous amount of information about a swimmer's technique so that we can reinforce positive technique elements and we can also identify what's limiting a swimmer from going faster. And the hand force data is critical because it's directly related to how fast the swimmer will swim. Here are two swimmers uh, they started out on the first trial generating a minimal amount of force and then gradually increased their hand force over, a, over the series of 10 trials. And as they increased their hand force, they swam faster. And the regression lines that fit through these data points fits with the principles, principle of physics that there's a squared relationship between force and velocity. Well, from this hand force data, we've gotten information in four different areas where we, we find that if you stick with the conventional wisdom, that you'll end up swimming a lot slower. You will limit your performance as compared to following the science, being willing to risk and make changes in training. For example, it's customary to pick out the top performers 
really in any sport, but certainly in swimming, the top swimmers are used as a model. Swim like the fastest swimmer. Well, what has that done for us in terms of shoulder, in, in terms of injuries, specifically shoulder injuries? Here's the percent of swimmers with shoulder injuries from, uh, th this is 28 different groups from 19 different studies. And generally, at least one out of three swimmers has a shoulder injury. In a lot of cases, two out of three swimmers have a shoulder injury. So the conventional wisdom replicating the technique of a champion like Phelps is, is, uh, is really hurting uh, shoulders. Normally we think of pitchers as being the ones who suffer shoulder injuries. One study found that swimmers actually have more shoulder injuries than pitchers. So back to Phelps. And on the bottom, we have a biomechanical model of optimal technique. And we'll compare Phelps to the model. The yellow line shows the surface of the water. First of all, if you look at the position of Phelps' head, you can see how far below the surface he's got his head position. Now that sets him up for having a really awkward angle at the shoulders. So if we compare Phelps with the biomechanical model, we can see just how uh, stressful of a, of a position that he's got. Now, why is that stressful? Why does that cause injuries? Here's the torso. There's the, the, uh, the bone in the upper arm, and there's the bone in the shoulder. Between these two bones, there's a space for soft tissue. As you elevate your arm, you decrease the space between those bones, and it compresses the soft tissue. So the tissue, like the tendons, the bursa, between those bones gets compressed and leads to shoulder impingement. And just the one time that I asked you to raise your arms over your head, that's not going to cause shoulder impingement. But it's not unusual for a swimmer to perform a half a million strokes per year. And that repetition is a real problem. Well, here's a swimmer in a position very similar to the one that I showed you that Phelps was in. He's just completed his arm entry, and for two tenths of a second, whoop, for two tenths of a second, it's going to take him to get his arms down to a less stressful position. You notice during that time, he is also generating very little force. If we look at freestyle, the same concept applies. Swimmers typically complete the arm entry with the arm parallel to the surface. And this is an image of one of the fastest 100 meter freestylers in the world. He's going to waste three tenths of a second before he gets his arm into a position where he can generate any force. But during that time, he's also stressing his shoulders. This is a very stressful range of motion to have to, um, for your shoulder. So not only does it hurt the shoulder, but it also hurts your performance. Ted Becker is a former head trainer of the U.S. Olympic swim team. Ted and I have collaborated uh, for many years. And he had the idea of looking at not just how awkward of a position do swimmers normally put their shoulders in, but how long are they in that position? Well, for females, 
it is really, really uh, devastating to performance. These two studies were conducted with university swimmers. And you can see how much, how, how long of a percentage of the, the time that the arm's underwater that these swimmers are stressing their shoulders. Even for the male freestylers, 14% is a long uh, time, relatively speaking, for first of all to stress, stress your shoulders, but then second of all, that's just wasted motion. It's, it's not productive. It doesn't have to be like that. A swimmer can have a downward angle on the arm entry so that by the time the arm entry is completed, the, the, the most stressful uh, range of motion has been eliminated. Uh, but th this is not what tip swimmers typically do. This is not the conventional wisdom. And since we have so many swimmers in this group, you're, you, you, uh, I, I encourage you to check your own arm entry. When your arm gets in the water, is it parallel to the surface? More than likely it is. <clears throat> Let's switch to uh, the conventional wisdom for conditioning. Train hard is the, the conventional wisdom really for any sport, but certainly for swimming. But it, it has to be moderated. Here we've got a couple of females who are training for a team that is known for training really, really hard. And these uh, swimmers were tested in December for their hand force. And we use the December measurement as a uh, baseline for the rest of the season. And the idea is that at the end of the season, you taper, you recover, your muscles hypertrophy, you get stronger, and then you can swim faster than you did at the beginning of the season. Well, that's not the case with one of the swimmers. One swimmer is above the baseline at the end of the season, but the other one was not. Similarly, with two male swimmers. One swimmer's force values were depressed by almost 30% in the middle of the season. And he was not able to recover back up to the baseline at the end of the season. Now we had a group of swimmers and about half of them were able to generate more force at the end of the season than at the beginning of the season. Uh, the other half were not able to recover and generate more force. The ones who were able to generate more force at the end of the season only had their capacity to generate force di diminished by about 10% in the middle of the season. The ones who could not recover to the baseline, their force values were depressed by 20%. This really shows just how important it is to monitor performance all the way through the season. The conventional wisdom of training hard will only get you so far, but it's not gonna optimize performance. We need to use data to be able to do that. <clears throat> Once swimmers get to be teenagers, the emphasis is usually on conditioning and not on continuing to improve skills. And this hurts performance too. The active drag coefficient is the overall best measure of technique. And, and from the hand force data, we can calculate the active drag coefficient. Each one of these data points represents 10 swimmers. And their technique improves a lot until they get to be teenagers. Once they're teenagers, we don't see improvement. Is that because their technique is as good as it can get? Well, when we pull out the single swimmer in each group 
with the lowest active drag coefficient, and the, lo the lower your active drag coefficient, the more effective your technique. When we pull out the lowest one, we, we can see that they're about 20% better off than the average swimmer. Now here's a, here's a couple of swimmers who were not tested in this group, in this study. A 13-year-old female, 26-year-old male, and they have a really exceptional active drag coefficient. Their technique is exceptional. So the average teenager can do an awful lot to improve technique to swim faster. Simply having an emphasis on conditioning just because you're a teenager is not going to optimize performance. Anders Ericsson <coughs> is a psychologist, and he developed the concept of deliberate practice. And th this is a pretty trendy concept now. It includes a number of components that must be included in training to accelerate skill learning. Take, for example, replicating superior per performance. If you were one of those swimmers in, uh, that I showed you previously whose force values were so depressed, how are they going to be able to replicate superior performance when they're overtrained like that? And you know, think about any sport. If you're too fatigued to replicate superior performance, there's no way that you're going to be able to practice deliberately. And it takes deliberate practice to become an expert. Erickson is the expert on how to be an expert. And we conducted a study. We looked at, um, not yet, <laughs> get to that in a second. We conducted a study um, and, and uh, inter interviewed swimmers to find out what they were focused on. These were high school swimmers, so they were teenagers, and they were focused on conditioning. There were very few swimmers that were paying any attention at all to technique, and you can't practice deliberately if that's the case. What can deliberate practice do for you? And you know, my examples are in swimming, but really all of this applies to all different sports. As we saw earlier, there was a substantial improvement in technique until swimmers got to be teenagers. And on this graph, the active drag coefficient is expressed as an effect size, which is, is just the, the, uh, the best way to make comparisons with different groups. So in two years, there was a significant uh, effect, and 0.8 is considered a large effect. So substantial improvement in technique for those two years. Let's compare that to a group of 13-year-old swimmers that went through one week of deliberate practice. The amount that they improved is comparable in one week to two years of traditional practice. Because there's such an emphasis on conditioning as opposed to technique, once swimmers get older, their technique may even regress, as shown here. But there is great hope for even 17-year-old national caliber swimmers. Again, a substantial improvement in technique with a short-term treatment of deliberate practice. So deliberate, a short-term treatment of deliberate practice can make uh, an improvement comparable to a much longer treatment of traditional practice. So once again, sticking with the conventional wisdom is only going to get you so far. We have scientific data that shows there are alternatives that can improve performance more. Let's go back to uh, improving technique. <clears throat> Here we have Phelps again. 
He's just completed his left arm entry, and the yellow line shows the position of his left hand. His right hand is shown, his position is shown by the red line. Now let's look at him the other way around. Here his right hand has just completed the entry, and here's the position of his left hand. You can see the asymmetry. On the left, we call this a positive index of coordination. And that's because he's ready to start pulling with the left hand before he finishes pushing with the right hand. The coordination index on the right side is negative because there, that's going to result in gaps in propulsion. And for, for any of you who are not swimmers, when you go out for a run, have an asymmetry with your stride. You take a longer stride with one leg than the other. And let me know how that works for you. It's not helping Phelps anymore. That is, it's limiting his, his freestyle performance considerably. So if the hand that's out front is ready to start pulling when the opposite hand is done pushing, that's a zero index of coordination. If the entry arm stays in position while the other arm recovers, this is a negative index of coordination. You've probably heard of catch-up stroke. This is catch-up stroke. Probably the most common drill that we have in swimming. It's the conventional wisdom. Absolutely counterproductive. Guarantees you will swim slower, yet that's what, that's what swimmers do. Now, if the entry arm is ready to start pulling before the opposite hand has finished pushing, that's a positive index of coordination. Here are the force curves. Zero index of coordination. You're ready to start pulling when the opposite hand finishes pushing. Negative index of coordination, you have gaps in propulsion. Positive index of coordination, the force curves overlap. You have a more continuous source of propulsion. When you look at it this way, it's pretty easy to see that with a positive index of coordination, you can generate more force over a shorter amount of time. So of course you're gonna swim faster. How much faster? Well, from those force curves, we can calculate swimming velocity. With a positive index of coordination, you can swim fast enough to break 40 seconds for 100 meter freestyle right now. We don't have to wait 11 Olympiads. So here's the data points that I showed you when I started. Got a different regression line drawn through the data points so you can more easily see the changes in slope. When the competition first began, for 20 years, times dropped really, really quick. Then they leveled off. And that lasted about 40 years. In the early 60s, spearheaded by Doc Councilman, one of the most famous swimming coaches, who was also a sports scientist, Doc applied science. And it really led a revolution. There was a lot of research going on. There was a lot of science that was applied to swimming performance. It paid off. For 20 years, times dropped really quickly. Last 30 years, not quite the same. The slope has leveled off again. Well, where are we going to be? When, when are we going to get to a 40-second, 100-meter freestyle? Do we have to wait to the, to the year 2060? Or are there coaches that are willing to risk, break with the conventional wisdom, apply the science, and result in, in much faster swimming much sooner. We've got the scientific 
information to show us how to do that. Now, just in case that you think that the lack of application of science is because swimming is a non-revenue sport, let's compare swimming to the greatest revenue, the highest revenue sport. There are 32 NFL teams. Here's what they've got on their staff in the way of sports scientists. There's one psychologist out of all 32 teams. No biomechanists, no physiologists. So this is just not an issue with swimming. Science can be applied to all sports to improve performance. Thank you. Yes. Uh, it's a really good question because most swimmers naturally do that. It would be very natural to have an asymmetry just because you're trying to fit in the breathing. If a swimmer optimizes the breathing motion, it can be done so that you can hardly even tell when the head is being rotated. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be related to the arm coordination, although the natural thing would be to do that. Yes? <laughs> I knew somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> um, uh, you, 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 boy, I mean, it, <laughs> it's such a giant question. Um, you know, I, I really would rather not get into that. Um, I, I, don't, I haven't got a really good answer for you. I, mean, I, I work uh, specifically in swimming, and swimming is different than other sports in that we do it in the water as opposed to on the land. Um, the, 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 um, the advantage or, or uh, what, what makes... Uh, terrestrial sports different is that we are terrestrial creatures. So we more naturally will do things like running and jumping easier. Once you put a projectile in somebody's hand, it gets more complicated. Once you're trying to hit a projectile, then it gets really complicated. So uh, the, the, I mean, there's 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 really, uh, there is no activity that I can tell you that we couldn't apply science to. So, I hope that's, yeah. I have nothing against water polo. I used to play water polo. It's a great sport. I love it. Um, uh, second of all, uh, that's really what, what my biomechanical model is doing is, is not really a short, choppy stroke. It looks different than what swimmers typically do, but she's straightening her arms completely and can have a very long stroke length in doing so. It's, it, the, the difference is in the arm coordination. And then I think you asked one other thing in there. Right, right. 
Yeah, yeah. There's an awful lot of excessive training distance. And it's a tough job for a coach to, to balance that uh, adequate training distance and also an adequate emphasis on technique. In most cases, though, it's gone, it's gone too far in the conditioning direction. You know, I'd love to see what happens when, when there's more of an emphasis on, on the technique instruction. I guess I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>